So yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's my second in-person seminar in three years. Um, I'm moved. Uh, so I'll tell you about uh, some work I've been developing for some time. Uh, the first installment of this work was done with Daniel Zaffers towards the end of 2020, uh, where we outlined a framework for looking inside black holes in ADS-CFD. And there has been two uh, developments that uh, have been in the works for some time. There is a paper with Ping Gao that we published last November. Uh, and my talk today will be primarily focused on outlining the basics of the framework or reviewing the basics of the framework and, uh, and then uh, uh, re uh, going over the work with Ping, which is a kind of a concrete application of the framework we developed. And there is an ongoing work, a, per a perpetually uh, ongoing work with Daniel and Jan, where we're trying to resolve some final conceptual puzzles. I have slides for that, but I suspect we won't be able to cover most of it due to time. Uh, but I'm happy to discuss it offline. So the question is very simple. Oh, now this doesn't work. Hmm. Yeah, I think you have to click on the zoom. Okay, so got it. it okay, okay. So the question we want to ask is very simple. Suppose that you have uh, a holographic and formal field theory. Uh, you have simulated in your lab, you build some system that simulates n equals first per young mills, for example, uh, and um, you uh, prepare it in some state, that's a high energy state, dual to a black hole in ADS. Uh, and suppose that you uh, are interested in the experience of some observer that lives inside this ADS universe and decides to jump uh, inside the black hole you prepared in your lab. Can you as a person who has control of the CFT, with some kind of measurement, predict the statistics of an experiment, of the measurement of an experiment that this infalling observer will perform behind the horizon. Technically, what is the conformal field theory representation of an operator behind the horizon, if that even makes sense, when, whenever that makes sense? Uh, this is the question we want to kind of uh, get a handle on. And I want to emphasize, because I'm going to spend a lot of time on it, I want to emphasize that this is not just a technical problem. It's not that we know what operator we have to measure, but it's very complicated and we can't practically perform this computation. There is a, there is a puzzle regarding the very definition of this object. What, what, how do you even define this object without referring to the semi-classical bulk? So it's a conceptual puzzle on top of a technical one. Um, and the reason why it has, so right now, even if you were able practically to simulate n equals force per young mills in a quantum computer, you wouldn't know what measurement to perform to answer this question. So we would like to sort of build the language that will allow us to ask this question in the first place and then compute it. Uh, the reason why this object is so confusing, it shouldn't come as a surprise. It's, it's related to a version of the information problem, uh, namely, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of the information problem, but uh, uh, the, the point is that um, the one, vers one way of stating the information problem is, to, uh, is, as the, is as the question of whether the interior, the region behind the semi-classical horizon, exists in a general black hole microstate. Uh, and if it exists, if it's, an, if it's the smooth, kind of mostly empty region that GR predicts, or whether it's, an excited, it's in, a, in a highly excited state. So the question of whether this operator makes sense and what's its, what its expectation value is, is directly related to the question of concretely asking the firewall question. Is there a firewall or is there not? Uh, so that's what we would like to sort of understand. I have some slides about the information problem, which I will skip. Um, and so yeah, roughly speaking, the question is, for some reason I don't like the way this moves. OK, that's better. So the, the, the concrete question is, can we define from CFT principles a local observable inside the black hole? The type of observable that the infalling observer would be able to couple their devices to and measure. OK. So. I want to spend the first part of my talk outlining somewhat intuitively the framework of our approach before I dive into the technical details of how to actually implement everything I'll say. So 
I'm warning you that you're going to have many questions about how is this done practically in a concrete setup at first, but I want to slowly kind of ease you in the kind of philosophy of the, of the approach and then go into the details. So uh, technical details will come ultimately, I promise you. So the approach that we followed was the following. Um, we thought of trying to address this question in an operational way. So we thought, let's try to introduce an actual observer into the system, some sort of physical excitation, some physical system that's going to fall inside the black hole. And then the strategy will be the following. Assume that, let's assume that we have access to the CFT representation of an operator at some initial moment in time outside of the black hole. This we know how to reconstruct holographically. There is reliable techniques for reconstructing this bulk field in, uh, perturbatively in 1 over n uh, in terms of some smeared uh, multi-trace operator on the boundary. Um, so this is an input to the approach. And then we would like to learn how to take this degree of freedom and propagate it in the proper time of this internal ADS observer. So what does it mean in the CFT to propagate a degree of freedom uh, along, uh, along this word line to evolve it with the proper time Hamiltonian of this, of this guy? Then if we knew how to do this, then we could simply define this operator behind the horizon uh, in, as the Heisenberg operator obtained from the initial guy with, this, with the relevant Hamiltonian evolution. Um, so this is, but of course, we would like to understand how to propagate this pro in proper time directly in the CFT. So sort of understand microscopically this internal clock. Uh, because, okay, in, in, at the level of uh, effective field theory in the bulk, we know what this proper time Hamiltonian is. You just take the bulk stress tensor and you integrate it over some cos slice with the appropriate vector field. And you can make, construct an operator that, that will evolve you uh, along any slicing you like. But uh, that doesn't actually allow us to like, resolve the confusions that uh, exist about the black hole interior because it's using semi-classical physics. We would like to, to, address, to find the, uh, the, this generator directly in the CFT. So this will be the task. I understand what does this internal time evolution mean in the CFT. All right. So what do I mean by an observer? So, in the original paper with Daniel, uh, we identified a kind of natural and convenient type of bulk observer. And this, is, uh, and this was to actually identify the observer themselves with a the black hole. So let's say that here you, I'm drawing a, a time slice of this ADS universe. There's a big black hole at the center. And then we would like to kind of probe the interior of this black hole by introducing some small black hole somewhere out in the asymptotic boundary and let it uh, fall inside the big black hole. So the evolution of this universe would look kind of like this. This is not exactly a Penrose diagram because I can't really draw a Penrose diagram with two black holes. But here, this is the horizon of the big black hole. And here I'm approximating the small black hole by some probe following a geodesic um, falling inside. Of course, from the outside point of view, all that happens is a black hole merger, right? It's the black hole just gets bigger. But if you were on a planet sort of uh, um, rotating around this black hole, nothing special would happen in, at this horizon crossing. The black hole continues to propagate further inwards. So, this is, uh, so there is a meaningful notion of propagating degrees of freedom in the frame, in the reference frame of this, uh, of this infalling black hole. Uh, okay, right. It doesn't have to be a black hole. Clearly, none of us is a black hole. Uh, the black hole is convenient for a number of reasons. Um, uh, so one reason, for example, is that it's uh, fairly simple to, to prepare holographically a state that contains a black hole in it. So it's actually the easiest sort of probe that you can introduce uh, because uh, it's fairly generic. Assuming that you have enough energy in the system and you... Uh, the, the, a, a gener because they, you don't have to be very careful about how you fine tune the state to create a black hole because they entropically dominate under certain conditions. And that's the key. Um, 
Another thing is that they're clearly semi-classical in the box, so I can trust the fact that, you know, to some approximation this pro propagates semi-classically and its reference frame makes sense. Uh, and there's a number of other reasons that we'll see them at work. One of which is that the, the, re the kind of the reference frame, what does proper time in the frame of the black hole mean in that case? Well, it, near, in the neighborhood of the black hole, in the rest frame of the black hole, there is the, Schwarz, there is, the geometry looks approximately Schwarzschild. And there's a local time-like killing vector, approximate local time-like killing vector, which is the Schwarzschild time evolution. So what we mean here by this proper time Hamiltonian we, we are looking for is precisely this Schwarzschild time clock. If we can identify a CFT observable, that CFT operator that generates that Schwarzschild time uh, translations, then we're in business. <clears throat> so, um, and in very broad strokes, the proposal that I will discuss in much more detail as we go on, but I want you to, ha to be in the right mindset. Um, the answer is the following, that the this near horizon Schwarzschild Hamiltonian, the proper time generator we're looking for, is related to the modular Hamiltonian of the system after we trace out the small black hole. Now, this is a statement that is stated currently very vaguely, and I'll make it precise in a second. Uh, but the point is, you have a big universe described with containing two black holes and all the whole system is in some global state, which is a CFT state. Um, so what, we, what you want to do is to sort of trace out the degrees of freedom that make up your observer, your small black hole. And then the rest of the universe is, is, uh, is endowed now with some reduced density matrix. Uh, the modular Hamiltonian of that reduced density matrix, I mean the logarithm of that reduced density matrix, uh, is under certain conditions, this generator of the Schwarzschild time evolution in the neighborhood of the black hole. This is the, in broad strokes, the statement I'm gonna try to convince you of. I have given you zero evidence right now for why this is true, but slowly we'll see why this works. <clears throat> so in sort of, this is a claim about that, that the, the time experienced by a, an internal subsystem is related to the quantum correlations of the subsystem with the rest of the universe. That's kind of the philosophy underlying this. Yeah, so you want to trace out the black hole, the, the, the probe black hole, you want to trace out your observer, uh, and then you have a modular Hamiltonian for the rest of the universe. This is what, you, can, you should think of this modular Hamiltonian as sort of evolving, somehow co-moving you with the observer. Uh, evolving the rest of the universe with reference to the observer. Now, this modular Hamiltonian is not, uh, one second, it's not necessarily local. In fact, this statement is not true uh, in the kind of generality that I'm stating it right now. I'm just slowly bringing you into the mindset for understanding the subtleties. But this is kind of the first order statement. We'll correct it in various ways. Yes? Is this a version of, of the thermal time hypothesis? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it, it uh, descends from the same conceptual lineage uh, of ideas, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Um, yeah. In, this, in the simple case where we don't draw this black hole, it's a much bigger black hole, but in the NKAT is a very big particles, um, then the, if the evolution that you described is just a black hole, I mean, I can, I can go into a frame where the black hole black hole is at the center, right? Yeah. And I can just think of some particles floating around, and they're, um, well, they're, they're always there. Yeah. Um, but but there's small perturbations on this Schwarzschild background, um, and they I guess they always stay small perturbations. Well, it depends. So right. So in fact, that's actually the next thing I wanted to briefly talk about to give you some intuition for why this is even a sensible thing to do. The simplest thing to say, well, let's forget about this fairly complicated setup of a small black hole falling inside another black hole. Does this work if you just have a black hole sitting at the center of ADS, right? Um, 
So, um, so in this case, how would you introduce this? So let me just, I'll answer your question while at the same time explaining the next part of my talk. Um, so um, how would you introduce a black hole in ADS? Well, what you would do, I mean, one thing, you would just put the system in a thermal state. Another way, which will be convenient later on for various reasons, uh, of thinking about this preparation of the thermal state is the following. Let's say this is the universe you're interested in, in looking at. This is your system. Uh, and you bring in a second copy of that system for convenience, which we will, refer, we will call the reference. And then you initiate these two systems in the thermal field double state. And the thermal field double state, uh, I'll just write it here for reference. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. Up to normalization is simply e to the minus. It's just this appropriate entangled state between the energy eigenstates of the system and the reference. <clears throat> so this state describes a pair of black holes in these two universes, entangled in some, uh, connected by a wormhole. And in this case, if you, uh, what do we mean now by taking, by considering the modular Hamiltonian of the system after we trace out the black hole? Well, here we mean something very simple, and that's kind of the convenience of introducing the reference. Uh, tracing out the black hole amounts to tracing out this reference system. So in order to obtain this uh, modular Hamiltonian I'm talking about, the, the relevant reduced density matrix is simply uh, the density matrix obtained by taking the TFD between the system and the reference and tracing out the reference. This is kind of declaring ignorance of the microstate of the black hole. But okay, in this case, this is a very simple s statement because in that case, the modular Hamiltonian is simply um, beta times H, where H is the Hamiltonian of the boundary. And we know that for a static black hole, uh, the Hamiltonian of the boundary generates this, uh, this time-like killing vector, uh, the Schwarzschild time translations in the bulk. So in this case, it's of course a trivial statement. Here, it's, you just have a static universe. There is a preferred kind of time-like symmetry. There's a preferred time-like direction, and this is a direction that the boundary Hamiltonian generates. Um, so the statement is that even if you do more complicated things in this set setup, you can boost this black hole and give it some momentum. You can add particles that back react on the geometry that there is some sense in which uh, the modular Hamiltonian of these more complicated states continues to propagate you uh, in, uh, in this uh, kind of uh, proper time clock, although the, the statement uh, has to be corrected in the sense that the precise statement would be the following. There is some neighborhood of the black hole in the more general situation. There is some neighborhood of, la of the black hole that I will refer to as the atmosphere. You can think of it as just a few Schwarzschild radius away from the probe. Uh, and the statement is that taking the operators, the local operators in this atmosphere and propagating them in Schwarzschild time can be expressed as evolution with this modular clock, namely an operator up here, which is at some Schwarzschild time, let's call it T, is related to some operator phi at the same relative location to the horizon via this modular evolution. If you go too far from the, from the black hole, far away from the atmosphere, that will stop being true. Uh, in, 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 uh, the modular Hamiltonian is defined on the boundary. The thing that is defined in the bulk is this initial, the thing that we have assumed as an input from the bulk is the initial operator near the atmosphere. So, yeah, I, I have assumed I knew how, I assumed I know how to HKLL one thing at one time. And then I want to define everything in, along the black hole word line into the future with reference to that guy. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as I add some particles on the left, yeah. Hamiltonian will, will be more complicated, correct. Okay, but, the, but the time evolution on the boundary still should be done with the ordinary Hamiltonian. That's right, yes. So this is a, an interesting uh, uh, fact, uh, which 
ultimately one needs to address. And uh, the, the way I'm addressing it in this slide is uh, by the fact that this statement here in local equilibrium does a lot of heavy lifting over here. So the statement is that the near horizon Schwarzschild Hamiltonian, the geometric time evolution near the black hole, coincides with the modular Hamiltonian K, assuming that no particles disturb the atmosphere, no particles fall in hit my probe. If you have excitations that don't fall inside your probe black hole, uh, as long as the, the atmosphere remains in thermal equilibrium, in local thermal equilibrium, then that statement is true. If there are particles that fall inside your probe and therefore disturb that local thermal equilibrium, then your modular flow is not geometric and then you have more work to do. And I'm not explaining right now what to do to correct this. I have slides towards the end for understanding this. But the key statement is that you, this correspondence is not always true. It's true under conditions. It's true for those states that do not contain infalling particles that are hitting your probe, as long as your black hole is in this local kind of vacuum state. It will change the modular Hamiltonian as an operator, but the question we are asking is, will it change the modular flow of the atmosphere operators? We're not trying to define globally an operator that evolves along a certain slice. We're trying to relate uh, the operators near our black hole at some later time to the operators near the black hole at an earlier time. So what we're interested in is not the modular Hamiltonian as an operator, but rather the, the action of the modular Hamiltonian on a particular small subalgebra associated to this near horizon region. Uh, why did the operators pick local well, this is the claim I'm making. Well, uh, right, so the statement is that a local observable at some later time is related to a local observable at an earlier time via this evolution. That's the statement. If you express, of course, this operator on this time slice is non locally spread out because you have to. But the point is that what you interpret as a local field here is related to the local field here via this evolution. That's the statement. It's not unreasonable to start from free theory of growth to free point and see what happens. Yeah, it's, it's not. Uh, this, this is an uh, interaction between probes and probes or whatever. That's a kind of next order thing. Uh, right, yeah. So you can think of it like that. This is like. Uh, it's. it's it's a little bit, it's not, and it's not just, um, it's a little bit more subtle than just a free approximation. Um, so the, if, if there are excitations here that will fall in the black that hole. That's not free. I mean, because black hole is a problem, I said free point. Ah, uh ah. -uh. So, so then yeah, if, if, it's not a reason to start from there. As long as there is no other excitations in the universe, and, uh, or no other excitations that intercept yeah. Your, the yeah. word line of your black hole, then this no, works. That's what I said, interaction. Okay, okay, problems. right. That's In that case, I agree. But of course, uh, you have to, as you say, this can only be the starting point. You have to eventually sure. uh, explain what you do in more general situations, and I'm hoping to get there. Uh, but uh, this is our starting point, that as long as the atmosphere, and let's actually make the statement precise, and here's the formal argument, and I'll give you a particular, the next step is to kind of uh, see this in practice in some toy example. Um, but the formal argument that we put forward in 2020, and it's the reason for believing this identification uh, in this kind of free kind of approximation, is this formal argument. Um, namely, uh, what, 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 what does local thermal equilibrium near the atmosphere mean? It means that correlators in the atmosphere satisfy the KMS condition. With respect to what? Well, the canonical clock in the, in the neighborhood of the black hole is the Schwarzschild time translations. So the KMS condition is the definition of thermality in QFT, in a sense. Uh, so this means that if you, Euclidean, if you translate one of these, let's say, operators in this two-point function uh, in Euclidean time by an amount beta, then you get back the same correlation function, but with the order of the two operators uh, reversed. So this is a symmetry of thermal correlation functions. This defines what local thermal equilibrium means, in a sense. 
Um, so this means that these are proper local thermal equilibrium means that near horizon operators, operators near my probe satisfy this condition where this is Euclidean Schwarzschild time translation. But the modular Hamiltonian uh, is defined as precisely this KMS operator for any state and for any operators. So this is a statement close to my probe black hole. This is a statement for all operators. Here I'm being a little fast. The thing that satisfies this KMS condition is the so-called total modular Hamiltonian, which is a combination of this modular Hamiltonian and the reference one, but I'll, I'll suppress this for now. The point is that the, the K, a modular Hamiltonian can be alternatively and more rigorously defined as this KMS operator, which means that in the regime where both this and this are true, the modular Hamiltonian has the same matrix elements as the Schwarzschild, time, as Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild Hamiltonian. So if my atmosphere is in local thermal equilibrium, the modular Hamiltonian acts in this region as Schwarzschild time translations. This is the for, this is the, if you violate this condition, you don't violate this condition because the modular Hamiltonian always satisfies this. So if you violate this, then of course you ruin the validity of the statement that I just made. But as long as this condition is satisfied, then these two clocks are identified. All right, so now at this point, okay, I gave you some arguments. Some of you may be happy with them. Some of you may not be happy with them. Um, uh, so there is two questions that arise exactly at this point. First of all, does this work and can you actually do something with it? Because it feels like a fairly formal statement. Uh, and then the second question is, well, okay, so there is, uh, there is, a, there is a situation in which um, this prescription seems to only work assuming that this local thermal equilibrium holds. But the whole point of trying to reconstruct uh, trying to evolve operators along a particular uh, trajectory was to, to detect potential excitations that are about to hit us later on. So this, is, this sort of works, but it works in the situations that we don't care about what the answer is. So these are the two questions that you may have at this point. Does this work? And what about non-equilibrium states? So, so these two questions are addressed in these two works that I referenced in the beginning. Um, an explicit implementation of this idea in SYK, which I'm about to explain now, was described in my paper with Ping. And the, how to extend this properly in, in general states is the paper in preparation with Jan and Daniel. So I will focus on showing you an explicit example where all the moving parts are understood and these computations can be done. And this dictionary can be established concretely and then comment on what, what to do in the more general situation uh, away from this. So this is the plan for the rest of the talk. Let's probably keep an eye on the time. Wait, but this, this is the, the, the thermal hypothesis, right? The, the statement so far has been the... Yes, I'm using, yeah, so I'm using local thermal equilibrium to define the time relative to my observer. Right. Uh, in the neighborhood of my observer, yes, that's right. Yes. And, they, and the, the argument is the paper of, of Roelia and Collins. Say again? The, the argument is the paper of Roelia and Collins. It's not, um, there's not another ingredient, right? Uh, well, I only know how, I mean, there's no other ingredient. Well, so far, I just uh, I made a statement. And the statement is that, Assuming by the definition of the modular Hamiltonian and by definition of the local thermal equilibrium near my probe, these two notions of time coincide in the neighborhood of, of my probe. Uh, the new ingredients, well, first we have to show that this actually works concretely, and I haven't told you how to prepare that observer state and so on. I'm about to explain it now. And then you have to also understand what happens in more general situations, and that is the later part. Okay. All right, so how do we, so this was a fairly formal discussion, but how do you even prepare a state like this? Well, we discussed a particular situation. Uh, here's a case of introducing some black hole observer into a system with nothing else, just an empty ADS universe. We brought another copy of the reference, 
another copy of the CFT, which we call the reference, we studied in the thermal field double state. And then tracing out the observer was tracing out this reference we appended. So more generally, what, how would you imagine that situation? How would you prepare a more interesting state? Well, this, preparing this system in the thermal field double state, you can think of this as, I mean, I'm going to say something very trivial, but it's simply just, you can think of it as starting from the vacuum state for the system and the reference, and then acting on it with an appropriate pair of, uh, with a sum of appropriate pairs of operators on the system and the reference in this correlated way, where you sum over operators with the appropriate coefficients that I'm not going to make precise here. This is just a trivial consequence of state operator correspondence. Um, so a way of somehow introducing this black hole, and of course, all you have to be careful about is what are these coefficients, what is the, the energy width uh, or the, conformal, the width of conformal dimensions that I include in the sum and so on. But at a very kind of uh, uh, coarse level, the way you would prepare this state, namely a big black hole at the center uh, with a pro-black hole to fall in, would be in a, via a path integral of this type in the CFT. So this is your system CFT. You have a Euclidean path integral, and you have some sort of heavy operator insertion at the origin that prepares your big black hole you want to jump inside. And then what you're going to do is you're going to append this extra reference system that I'm suppressing, and you're going to act, uh, you're going to insert another sort of insertion in the path integral, which is correlated in this way. Assuming you pick these coefficients appropriately, and by appropriately I mean you constrain the, the width of, uh, uh, assuming that this has support in sufficiently high energy degrees of freedom, the dominant branch of this system wave function will be uh, precisely uh, a universe with a big black hole at the center from the primary you put at the origin and a small black hole with the appropriate quantum numbers far out in the boundary. Yes? So this one, no, that was a great picture. Can you keep that one? This one? No, but the, the, the big dot in black. Uh, so I can, presumably I can uh, use some symmetry transformation to move the big dot to the boundary and the small dot in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then I, I, the construction that you just described is basically getting back to this picture, right? I have a thermal field bubble for the small black hole, and I can do giant black hole, but it kind of looks small because I put it out near the boundary, and now I can start falling in. Yeah, by small. Yeah, yeah, it's equivalent by symmetry. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah, there's no. Yeah, these two are just two different conformal frames of the whole thing. What, what, I'm, what I'm a little confused about is that the, the giant black hole, when it gets, even by the time its horizon gets close to the small black hole, don't you have? Let me postpone that question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, there is an important subtlety here that I'm kind of uh, uh, not commenting on because but it's a very interesting story, but there's only so much time in a seminar. Um, so to properly, uh, you know, I, I, I'm referring to big black hole here and small black hole without telling you what big and small means um, or how small that small black hole needs to be in order for this prescription to make sense. Okay, so... It turns out, for reasons that I won't be explaining in detail right now, but I'm happy to discuss them afterwards, that uh, to actually use a, a black hole as a probe of another black hole's interior, uh, this small black hole cannot be a, a, a black hole described in the canonical ensemble, because canonical black holes are necessarily larger than ADS size. Um, which means, uh, so this cannot be a state prepared, strictly speaking, in this thermal field double that I commented earlier, because its size will necessarily have to be larger than ADS size, which means its temperature is of order one over LADS. And as it turns out, the amount of proper time it takes from the moment you cross the horizon till you hit the singularity of the big black hole, no matter the size, is given by LADS. So this means that a canonical black hole will hit the singularity in less than a thermal time, or in approximately a thermal time, and that's a problem for the prescription, as we'll see later on. So you actually need to make this smaller than LADS in order for this prescription to be meaningful. 
Now you may be confused, how can you do this with this Gibbon, I'm sorry, this hogging page phase transition? How is this possible? Well, it turns out that if you, uh, constrain, if you narrow the energy width of the canonical ensemble a bit, namely, instead of considering the thermal field double state, that we considered before, between system and reference, if uh, instead of having this state, you also include some enveloping function here with some width which is smaller than the width of the canonical ensemble. This is a sort of a micro-canonical thermal field double. So it turns out that these types of states um, continue to describe black holes, namely the black holes remain the dominant contribution in the micro-canonical ensemble for sizes parametrically smaller than LADS. And that's an important thing. There are all sorts of subtleties uh, coming with these with this objects that I won't go into details right now. But the point is that this black hole has to be below LADS. And the way to do this is to further refine that state you use to prepare it to be a micro-canonical TFD and not a canonical TFD. This is just for full disclosure. Uh, no, yeah, it, it, these are stable black holes. Yeah, you can make it, you cannot make it arbitrarily small, but you can make the ratio. So this is, this. okay, let's be precise. You can talk about the Schwalter radius of this microcanonical black hole uh, as uh, in units of either LADS or of units of L Planck. So the radius of the small black hole in units of LADS goes to zero as you take n to infinity. But the radius with respect to the Planck length remain, it goes to infinity as you take n to infinity. So this is kind of an intermediate size. Macroscopic, but small as compared to the cosmological uh, uh, radius. Without doing this, you don't have to stain the thermal field double if you use a position space information. If you, you use know, what? If you use a position space information, you can always create the small graph or example with the, with the reverse frame. But you probably don't want to do that yeah, this is, these are nice because they're also technically under well, good control. I mean, yeah. It's kind of the same as the TFD, but kind of constrained. You, if you, use, uh, space, spatial you, can you mean just collapse, collapse matter to form a small black hole? Oh, That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just a focus, focusing on a typical energy within this uh, region yeah. by using position space information. Because right. From all philosophical, you can have a small black hole, which is kind of an example. Right. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I sympathize. I just wanted to give you a concrete state yeah, that yeah, kind of is nice, simple to write. But yes, so, all right, so, sorry. Right, so a general situation up to the subtlety that uh, I just discussed, uh, the, this is a sort of preparation of the relevant state. And what would the operator that evolves you in this Schwarzschild time uh, be? Well, it would be the modular Hamiltonian of the CFT in that state after you trace out the reference. This is the prescription. So the goal now is to apply it. Let's apply it to a particular example and see if it actually works and see exactly how it works and what subtleties there are because this has been a fairly formal discussion. Um, all right, so Ping and I applied this technique in SYK and I would like to give you some details now of how this works. So SYK ADS2 is a toy example of the holographic duality. It's a low dimensional example and it's a correspondence between uh, a particular uh, Dilaton gravity theory in ADS2, the Jakiv Teitelbaum gravity, and a pair of uh, SYK models. These SYK models are um, uh, quantum mechanical systems. They're composed of Majorana fermions. You have a large number of Majorana flavors that I call n. The number of flavors is n, which we take to be large. Each of them has a Hamiltonian that couples uh, bunches of Q Majorana fermions together with coefficients J, which are treated as Gaussian random variables. But the two SYKs, which I refer to here as the left and right SYK, are decoupled. So each of them is, has, contains this kind of Q local coupling, but the two systems separately are decoupled. And uh, the statement is that a particular low energy sector of this system about a particular uh, state uh, describes um, 
uh, the, uh, describes uh, this, the gravitational dynamics of this Dilaton gravity theory. All right. So the important thing for our purposes, oops, excuse me. Uh, the important thing for our purposes is that there exists a state in that SYK that describes a, a black hole in ADS2. And this is, of course, the thermal field double state between the left and right. So you have energy eigenses of the left, energy eigenses of the right. You can prepare the two systems in this, uh, in this thermal field double state. And this describes, we have understood, holographically describes a pair of ADS2 Rindler wedges. The, so there, there's the left and right wedge. The asymptotic boundary of the left wedge is the left SYK, same thing for the right. And uh, uh, the global geometry is that of this ADS2. Of this ADS uh, so there's a Rindler horizon. Uh, and this, is, this, is the, this configuration here is sort of the black hole that we want, whose interior we want to explore. All right, so this is the preparation of the background, the background we want to travel in. So now we want to introduce our observer into the system. Well, if you want to introduce some single particle, what you would do is that you would go back to this Euclidean preparation of the system, and you would just insert some fermion somewhere along this boundary part, uh, path integral. And the, so there's two numbers here. There's the, the, the arc length from this end and the arc length from the other end. And these two arc lengths de de uh, determine uh, at what location this particle is inserted in this initial slice, in this initial state. And the state con con uh, 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 describing that particle insertion will look something like this. So there's some amount of Euclidean path integral from uh, this uh, point to the insertion. There's the insertion of the Majorana fermion and the rest of the path integral. Okay, I'm also noticing that the figures so weird over there, but they're fine on my laptop. I don't know what's going on, but uh, yeah. Okay, and now we want to not introduce a particle, but we want to introduce an observer. And we made all this fuss about this black hole observer. In this case, we can't quite introduce a black, a second black hole in the system. It's uh, the, the gravitation. There's no interesting. Yeah, you can't do that. It's uh, uh, there's no. You can't introduce a second black hole geometrically in this case. But what you can do is introduce a highly entropic probe. So what you can do is that instead of acting with a single Majorana insertion over here, what you'll do is the procedure we explained before. You'll append a reference, and instead you will, you will act with this operator that couples the, your system to the reference, that entangles more precisely uh, the system and the reference with a state that looks like this. So you start the reference in some vi Here I have taken the reference for, concre for concreteness to be uh, n Dirac fermions, free Dirac fermions. But that's just for being explicit. Uh, and I've coupled them, and I made a choice for this uh, uh, unitary that I used to entangle the two systems. Uh, and the only free parameter that I allowed was this parameter alpha here that controls how much entropy I'm introducing into the system. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply now the method that we outlined formally before, and we'll see how the reconstruction depends on this parameter alpha and what interesting things we can get out of this. I'm sorry? So these betas here are the arc, so there is this Euclidean path integral that prepares the state, and these betas control the arc lengths uh, uh, this, these two arc lengths, namely they kind of determine better left plus better right halves is the total arc length from left to right, and the two, the separation between them just de determines the location at which I'm introducing the probe. Um, so, the uh, yeah, the, which in the location at which I'm introducing the probe determines exactly at what distance from the boundary or the bifurcate horizon. Uh, it will appear at um, on the initial slice. So that's that's uh... all right. So the operator we're interested in now is to take this state and then trace out the reference to obtain the modular Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, right. I think I'm using the wrong set of slides. I, yeah, 
Okay, this is an older version of the slides. I'm pretty sure I moved this slide from here. Okay, so this doesn't show very well, so I'm gonna, just going to draw it. So, all right, so we have this Euclidean path integral that prepares, uh, so this is the type of, let me represent as this. This is the state that with, uh, with our two-sided ABS2 black hole with the probe in it. This is the Euclidean path integral that prepares it. I want to take two copies of that state. Uh, and then I want to trace out the reference. And tracing out the reference, I will represent it by this dotted line over here. So this is sort of, this would be the, de the reduced density matrix of, this, of the two SYKs after we trace out the reference. Um, so it turns out that there is, you can explicitly, I mean, you can explicitly compute this given that we have the states explicitly here. You can write it down explicitly, and there's another way of representing that, that state, which is in this, in this other way, where you have, so here is left, right, left, right, and we trace out the reference. So there's another way. This density matrix is equal to, to the path integral that prepared, that's prepared like this. So you have uh, some amount of Euclidean evolution of the left system, some amount of Euclidean evolution of the right system. This is equal to beta left. This is equal to beta right. And there's a bilocal coupling between these two path integrals, which is of this form here. It's a bilocal coupling of the Majorana fermions with the coupling, which I'm defining here mu, to be this mu guy, uh, where this mu uh, is related to this parameter alpha that controls the, the entropy of the probe via some relation. It's a function of this alpha. So you should think of these two ways of representing this path integral as two different channels on which you expand this computation. This is an exact equality. I'll, you can prove this equality algebraically uh, in this case. Okay, so this is the density matrix. And now what we want to do is take the logarithm of this and then evolve some bulk field with it and ask, does this do the job? OK. So now that we've set everything up, let's see what this means. So the statement that I'm going to present the computation that supports uh, is the following. If you take some bulk field, let's say some bulk fermion field, which I refer to here as chi, which is on the initial, some local degree of freedom, some local operator on the initial time slice, at some geodesic distance L, let's say, from the location of, our, of my probe. Then the claim is that if I take this degree of freedom, which I assume, remember, I know how to represent on the boundary in terms of SYK degrees of freedom, and I conjugate it with this modular flow, then I get a one parameter family of SYK operators with the following interpretation. You, it's, this gives you the, the same bulk field. This gives you the, the, fa the following family of local bulk operators. You move along the world line by some amount of proper time tau, which is related to the modular time up to a, a proportionality constant. Um, and then you, you find the field that is at the same relative location, at the same location relative to the geodesic as the original guy. So if this was obtained from the probe by shooting an orthogonal geodesic and following by length L. This is this obtained in exactly the same way, but the anchoring point is at some proper time tau later. And the only uh, thing that relates the geometric proper time and the modular time is this effective temperature of the probe that's related to this temperature or the entropy, if you like, of, uh, of the state that of my observer. This is the dictionary. This is what we explained. This is the formal argument we gave earlier. This is how it's supposed to act. Okay. Now, does this work? Can you actually do this computation and show that this geometric transport problem is equivalent to this quantum mechanical evolution problem? Can you actually compute this and show this? So, right. So the answer is yes. In fact, here's what we did. If what I'm saying is true, how will you diagnose whether this works or not? Here's something cute that you can do. You can introduce some excitation on the left, right? And you can compute 
the causal propagator, namely the anti-commutator for fermions, of the modularly evolved chi uh, and this uh, left degree of freedom uh, left. What do we expect from the Bock point of view? What we expect is that as long as, this as long as if this modular flow is geometric as I'm claiming, for some amount of modular time that should be zero or small in any approximation we're making, and then it should sharply spike the moment we cross the light cone of this field and then stabilize to some order one value. But the important thing, so this is the expectation from the book, but the important thing is that this object over here is entirely defined in the SYK. All the objects, rho, we, did, we prepared it, it's the state we prepared the system in. This modular evolution, again, we know, we have expressed it entirely in the CFT. So this is an SYK com com computation that is supposed to reveal a sharp light structure uh, in the box. And that's the result of SYK. So here's the plot. What you're seeing here uh, is three plots, uh, a blue, an orange, and a green, corresponding to the, this anti-commutator for three different locations of this chi left point. So the blue, which is the one that spikes first, corresponds to a location closer to the horizon, and then you, you go further and further as it moves. Uh, and this is uh, the plot of this causal propagator, sorry, this, this SYK computation. This is a result that comes straight from the SYK. It's the function of this correlator as a function of this modular time. Now, I'm showing you a plot, not because we got this numerically, but for dramatic effect. So we, we computed this in the parametric regime where the computation was under control. We could do this analytically. So we have a precise expression that matches the bot propagator. But seeing that spike was, a, was a, an emotional moment for me. So uh, I'm showing this uh, to cause the same emotional reaction to you. Um, so this is detection of an excitation behind the horizon of the ADS2 black hole using a, an entirely uh, SYK computation. Yes, I see Raphael has a question. So. Yes. Right. Here we can't have another black hole. Isn't that more like the kind of calculations that so so that I see. So we're just asking whether we can whether we can see those particles live inside the black hole from the Doppler perspective. Yeah, so what so more precisely we don't have two particles, we have a particle and a gas of particles in some mixed state and we're using the modular flow of that gas of particles to propagate, uh, uh, to propagate uh, some, so this is the gas, right? We don't, the, our black hole is substituted now with this gas of fermions that we introduced uh, with, this, uh, with this unitary here. So this unitary here inserts some gas of particles in a mixed state, right? Or more precisely, in a state that's entangled with that reference, which we are tracing out. So our black hole now is a gas of particles, and what we're doing is that we are using the modular Hamiltonian associated to this gas um, to propagate some degree of freedom chi here and sort of uh, uh, and detect a particle coming from the left. So our black hole has been substituted by a collection of, of fermions that are traveling in this background. It's not a black hole because we can introduce a black hole. And for that reason, the formal argument I gave about thermal equilibrium doesn't directly apply here. So the fact that this works relies on a slightly different statement, but ultimately closely related. Yeah, so we'll tell me if I'm confused, but like yes. my impression is that when you write this gas of operators, you're essentially creating something that couples left and right. Like they look a little bit like as if you're doing sort of like this eternal traversable wormhole. And in a sense, if you're now throwing this particle from the left, you're seeing it on the other side because this is like an eternal traverse form, right? So like right. there's always a probability. So is this an interpretation? Yeah, so I think that's, so, right. So the statement is, no, I think this intuition is ultimately correct. Uh, but let me make a few comments here. Yeah, so the statement is that 
if you have, you have this pair of entangled SYKs supporting this, tra this non-traversable wormhole, uh, and now what you want to do is you want to introduce a system that's entangled, you, you want to entangle part of the system, your gas, with a reference system. The statement is that in doing that, uh, the modular, by introducing, by preparing that state, uh, the, mod, the, the modular Hamiltonian of the universe, once you trace out the reference, contains a coupling between left and right. Uh, so this kind of follows, I think intuitively you should think of this as coming from essentially the monogamy of entanglement. If you try, you have these two entangled systems, you try to entangle part of it to the right and you end up entangling the whole thing. So you're kind of redistributing the entanglement of the whole system to the reference. So when you trace out the reference, it's not that you're entangled just with the right. You're entangled with a combination of left and right, which appears in this coupling of left and right. However, there is a conceptual difference in Oh, here, so, but it's important how we get the coupling in le between left and right in this prescription. I didn't, so for example, there is no obvious traversable wormhole you would try to construct if, let's say, this black hole you wanted to fall inside was single-sided, right? Mm -hmm. There is no second asymptotic boundary that you can couple and sort of try to go inside. But there's nothing that prevents me from doing exactly what I did right here uh, in a single-sided black hole setup, right? You can still introduce the observer and you can still trace out its microstates and you'll get the density matrix for the system and then you can propagate things with it. Uh, so uh, it's just to finish that statement. Uh, and therefore, there is a conceptual advantage in that I don't need to make a choice of a coupling between two systems. I get a coupling just as a consequence of the state that I prepared my system in. Raphael. The, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that, the, the so uh, let me make a precise statement because I guess the plot doesn't, doesn't uh, show this. The, you can, the fun so the functional form of this computation here, the functional form of this, uh, of this correlator as a function of what? Of, well, of course, the modular time and the various parameters that uh, enter the preparation of the state. Um, uh, match exactly to, with the bulk-to-bulk uh, -bulk propagator of two free uh, Dirac fermions in ADS2 um, in this kind of, kind of configuration. So it's, 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 an, it's an exact matching. Now, I, you, I'll explain where this, uh, I mean, there's, there's an important, there's, there's physics underlying this precise max, matching that I'm going to discuss in a second, but yes, you can precisely match the two computations analytically in the regime of validity of this prescription. But sometimes we find it's not important that whether it was reversible. No, no, yeah, but Ugo was uh, trying to relate this prescription to other approaches, and it is true that the only way you can get such a causal effect is if some coupling emerges, right? If this modular Hamiltonian I'm using contains a coupling between left and right. So this, mod this evolution, this law of evolution I'm using, this internal law of evolution, somehow couples left and right, so somehow it must be translatable in this language. And I think that is not an, an inaccurate description, but it's, um, um, yeah. Right. Okay, so right, this is a statement. Uh, let me actually see how much time I have. You have, I mean, we started a little late, so you have, let's okay. say, five more minutes. Okay, so I think I, I'll, I, I wanna... Hmm. For about like 10 minutes, is that, is that okay? And then we can, we can ask questions later if you wanna see. Yeah, yeah. Else. Oh yeah, well I have... At least we finish, I, 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 so here I have another two hours of material that I can go <laughs> over, but of course I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make you go through this. Um, I'm debating on whether I should show you uh, roughly how to set up this SYK computation. Uh, I think I should because I think it is, it's interesting. Okay, so let me just very briefly tell you uh, how do you even do this computation to begin with? Well, the whole point is that you want to compute this, uh, this modular float guy. Remember this chi of rho of s is this uh, bulk fermion conjugated 
by rho raised to an imaginary power. This was the modular flow. It was rho to the i s. Well, we, it, that's hard to compute, even though we know exactly what rho is. We know exactly what the density matrix is. We can write it down explicitly in terms of the Majorana fermions of the two systems. But to compute this is hard. So what we do is we resort to the favorite trick of theoretical physicists, the replica trick. So, so what you're going to have to do is sort of replace these imaginary powers with integer powers, compute this function for all integer powers of m and n, and then hope that you can get an analytic result that you can analytically continue to get the modular flow that you want. That's, that's the trick. And if you remember, the form of this uh, density matrix was this kind of H-shaped path integral of the system. So when you put a bunch of them, when you multiply a bunch of these reduced density matrices, what you get is some SYK graph, which topologically looks like this. So you have two circles with different circumferences for the left and right SYK, and a bunch of bilocal couplings localized uh, at equal spacings along this thing. So this is a graph. This is a, a Euclidean SYK um, uh, uh, partition function, which you want to compute. In particular, what you want to compute is a two-point function of a fermion on the left and a fermion on the right in this. Uh, you may consider this Euclidean path integral with these two insertions. OK, so this is a well-defined technical problem. You can try to do this. And I'm not going to bore you with the details, and there's lots of details, believe me. Uh, but the point is, you, what you do is you set this up in terms of the uh, precise microscopic degrees of freedom. You do the usual uh, average over couplings to obtain um, a, a, uh, this G sigma description of SYK. And then uh, the point is that each of these insertions here uh, has the effect of um, uh, can, can be parameters in terms of a gluing condition. So the point is that you get a, by integrating out the couplings, you get local differential equations controlling the propagator between different points on this graph. But every time you cross one of these insertions, you pick up a little rotation in the left and right Majorana uh, fermion space. Uh, so you parameterize these insertions as precisely this kind of uh, twists, twisted boundary conditions in this path integral. And then with some, there are some more global, uh, there are some global uh, boundary conditions related to the periodicity of these guys. Uh, so you set everything up and then you solve the differential equations in an approximation. So the approximation is you have to take large n, of course. You have to use, you have to work in one over Q perturbation theory. Uh, you have to take the uh, beta j, the temperature of this SYK to be large. And something that I want to comment on, uh, this computation only works when the entropy of the probe we're introducing is in a particular parametric regime. And this is why I bored you with this detail, because I just wanted to get to this point that the computation, which we can perform analytically, is only valid in a particular regime of this entropy of the probe that we're introducing. If the entropy of the observer we're introducing is too small, the computation breaks down. If the entropy of the observer is too big, the computation breaks down. But there's a parametric regime in the middle in which the computation works. Um, right. So that's the point. And then you perform the right analytic continuation, and you get to this plot, blah, blah, blah. We already discussed this. Um, so what are these? Oh, great. All right. So what are these? Uh, so what, how do you understand this uh, regime in which the computation works? Well, here's a very simple way that's kind of pictorial, and it can be uh, explained from the bulk point of view. So the computation was relying on computing this Euclidean path integral in SYK. Well, if you wanted to do this computation in the bulk, what you would do is you would look for the appropriate uh, Euclidean saddle of the bulk ADS geometry to fill in these boundary conditions. Well, there's two types of ways of filling in this graph. One is to fill in, these are shaded in my laptop, but apologies. Um, so one is to fill in the disks, and the other one is to fill in this topological cylinder. 
So when the entropy of, so it turns out that these two saddle points both appear, but they have, uh, but they exchange dominance as a function of the, of the entropy of the observer I'm introducing. So if the entropy of the observer is too big, order n, then it turns out that this disconnected saddle is the dominant one. And you can convince yourself very easily that um, a two-point function between left and right in this case is small, and its analytic continuation will not give you any interesting physics. This is the situation where the observer that I introduced has too much entropy, so I try to entangle a subsystem of my SYK with a reference too much, and I sort of decorrelate it left and right. So I kind of destroyed the wormhole I'm trying to jump inside by adding too much energy into the system. This is the case, and here the computation breaks down, modular flow is trivial, and the understanding in the book is you back-react it too much in the geometry you're trying to probe. Now, if you start reducing the entropy a little bit, at some point there's a crossover, and you go into this topological cylinder. This is where the computation works. Now you have this connected geometry connecting left and right, and now you have large correlations between left and right, and these give you the result that I quoted. But of course, if you try to reduce the entropy too much, at some point this kind of coupling between the two sides that are supporting this wormhole become too strong. So this wormhole pinches off and the correlation between different sides here becomes again very small. And this is the case where the entropy of the probe becomes very small, namely you go to the case where the rank of the density matrix is too small, so you don't really have a clock. You don't really have uh, enough microstates to resolve time. The, the, the black, the, sorry, the modular flow is just trivial. It approximates a projector. Um, it is in this intermediate regime that uh, the computation works, and you can also see that why, this is why, um, right, and, and the, point, the, important, the important thing is that it's universal, that it didn't really depend on the details of the state that I used to prepare my observer in. Uh, it was uh, it only really depending on the amount of entropy of the probe that I introduced. Where does, where, does it, does, where does this universality come from? Well, in our case here, it comes from the fact that well, it comes from the SL, the emergent SL to R symmetry of the SYK, which we know by now is a reflection of maximal chaos. So somehow, the maximally chaotic nature of the um, of the SYK is underlying the universality of this uh, modular flow of our probe in the regime that it works. And this is kind of the, the key physical statement that I think we extracted from this point of view. Key element number one, I'm not mentioning this because Ugo already commented on that, that by entangling the system with a reference to introduce our observer, we obtain an effective left-right coupling in the modular flow. So this is key element number one. Key element number two, this coupling is universal because as a result of this maximally chaotic nature of SYK. What's the relation with the emergent SL? Excuse me? What's the relation with the emergent Ah, yeah, so in this regime here, where you're in this phase, where which, uh, at intermediate entropies, but that you have this connected saddle, the, the functional form of the correlator is controlled by SL, SL2R symmetry. Yes, yeah, right. So it's, it's really the geometric background that kind of controls, the geometric background in this phase that kind of controls the ultimate modular float correlator. And, and the SL2R is kind of baked in that result. So you can actually be divided by SL2R, right? You divide it? Oh, yeah, yeah, the global SL2R, you mean? Uh, oh, yeah, the global SL2R, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but right, I'm just. But, but what I mean is that, the, right, but remember the correlator we're actually looking at is, so we're looking at a cor correlator like this. So you have this, you keep this operator fixed and then you want to, you're sort of translating a, an operator over here. Of course, all operators translated along this trajectory can be obtained from the original operator by the action of an, S, of an SL2R on this operator alone while keeping that fixed, right? So it's, it's namely this trajectory is an orbit of an SL2R generator. Okay. And that's, Good. right, so. And then, then it's dependence on that is the same as model dependence because it's a symmetry. Yeah, exactly. 
So the statement is that in the regime where this computation works, in the regime where you, you're in the right phase of the computation, modular flow generates an orbit of one of these SL2R generators. Which orbit? It depends on the particular location at which you introduced your probe. Yeah. And look, from the perspective of SYK, that's also like a large end, low energy range. Yes. So that's symmetry. That's right, yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, it's actually interesting, one, one of the things that, so uh, taming the approximations here is, is quite a nightmare, but we did. Um, uh, and uh, you can actually ask how do these plots, uh, so this, this sharp peaks that you get here depend on large n, depend on the one over q perturbation theory, depending, depend on the entropy of the probe being in the right regime, but they also depend on the large beta j limit of SYK, which is kind of the holographic kind of large coupling. Uh, and you may ask, well, how does it, how do, how, what happens if you kind of go away from, uh, very, if you start introducing one of the beta j corrections? And what you see is that this sharpness of the peak sort of starts going away. I mean, eventually you go outside the regime over which we have control of this computation, but uh, this sharp peak that you get in the holographic limit stops being the case. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, in uh, physical. Yeah, yeah, it's magic, yeah. I don't think there's, is there a deep significance? Okay, Q equals four is not large enough, I think. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but if, you do this, if you could solve that, you still get this phenomenon or not? That's the that I don't know. So we did work in one of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I expect so, but, um, but you see. But that's very different from large n. Large n is not technical. Large n is important, yeah. One over Q is, here's a technical convenience. Um, so uh, numerics, are tricky because remember there is an analytic continuation you're supposed to do at the end. So it's hard to imagine how you would get, you know, how you, how, you can use numerics to compute the Euclidean co co correlator that I have here, but to compute the analytic continuation, you're on your own. That's why it was important to work in a regime where we have analytic control over this. Okay, so uh, I'll end, uh, I'll end uh, your misery. Uh, so. Okay, so let me just very, as you can see, I have, uh, oh yeah, that's definitely all slides. Oh, great. Oh, great, all right. I, I don't even have my conclusions here. Sorry, guys, I messed up. Um, sorry, yeah. So the key elements were that, so our approach to summarize, I did a number of things at once, so it's good to kind of summarize. I made a proposal for what, the generator of time experienced by an internal subsystem of a quantum gravitational universe is microscopically, or at least a suggestion. And it's related to the thermodynamic na na notion of time, namely that the thermal notion of time, that the clock that generates the time in your reference frame seems to be related to what? To the correlations, the quantum correlations between yourself as an observer and the rest of the universe. By tracing out your, yourself, tracing out your microstate, declaring ignorance of your internal state, the rest of the universe has a clock, the modular clock, and this under conditions is related to the geometric clock in your neighborhood. That was statement number one. And then the reason why we developed that insight uh, was to sort of take an observer and propagate them inside a black hole. Now, we didn't solve the big problem, but we showed that this actually does work in a particular black hole, the black hole we prepare in SYK, and we were able to detect uh, signals inside, in the interior of this black hole, in this case, signals that we send from the other side using our technology. So it works, and it's practically uh, implementable. So that's good news. Now, is, this is not yet the problem we act, actually want to solve. The problem we actually want to solve in the end is to take an arbitrary black hole microstate in some higher dimensional setup and ask the question, is a typical, let's say, microstate excited in the interior? Does it have particles in the interior like this one, like in this case, or does it not? This is the big question, and I hope that this technology will help us gain some ground on answering this, and that's all for now. Thanks. <laughs>